Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of LPL Market Signals. The Jeff Bookbinder here, your host for today, with my friend and colleague Lawrence Gillum. It is January twenty fourth, twenty twenty three. Lawrence, how are you today? I'm doing well. I can't uh, can't complain too too much. The markets are off to a, a solid start this year, so everyone's happy. I think. And uh, of course, you are a fixed income strategist. Even bonds are up. So how about that? Something you haven't seen in a while. Uh, yep, I'm sure we're going to talk about that in a second, but it's it's a, a nice feeling to see green on the screen for bonds. Well, one of our agenda items today is certainly to um, talk about the Fed. So um, you'll you'll get your time to tell folks what um, the Fed rate hiking campaign means for bonds this year. Let's um, let's first uh, start with just a recap of the week uh, before we get into the main uh, bulk of the call, which is going to be on the. Um, the four main bull bear debates that we're seeing in the market these days. Uh, this That's the, the topic of our latest weekly market commentary, which you can find on LPL.com. So um, turning to last week, uh, recap really quickly, of course, somewhat old news by now, but um, here are three themes, uh, Lawrence, that we pulled out, you know, is the consumer tapped out, right? Um, you know, about half of the savings the excess savings for consumers in aggregate has been uh, spent. And certainly, um, you know, we're starting to eat into that second half a little bit. So, um, you know, that continues to be certainly a main area of focus. We we got the low jobless claims, though. So we have a good job market. You know, wages are rising. People are employed. Uh, so, you know, I guess the question is, you know, how long is that cash going to last? And will will consumers get enough of a benefit from falling inflation to sort of turn things around before those savings dwindle too much? Yeah, that's the sixty four thousand dollar question, right? So we are seeing wages increase for a a good segment of the economy. Inflation is falling, so that your your gross difference between wages and inflation are is is in, improving. So your spending power because of falling inflation is is improving as well. So. There are some some uh, signs that maybe the consumer tapped out. Retail sales came in a little softer last week, but all in all, we do th still think the consumer is uh, is in a pretty good position. Obviously, buoyed by that strong job uh, market, the labor market remains you know pretty healthy. Uh, in fact, so we 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 still have uh, confidence in the consumer on a go forward basis. Yeah, that's of course key to the soft landing, which which we'll get to or possible. Uh, soft landing, which we'll get to in a minute. So more evidence of falling inflation. Producer price uh, index last week was actually quite good uh, relative to expectations. You know, it's almost like the market has moved on and you know moved away from inflation fears and is really focused on uh, the question of whether we'll have a recession. But, you know, PPI, the year over year number fell a point uh, month over month from um, essentially 7.2 to 6.2. Uh, which, of course, is still too high, but moving in the right direction uh, and way better than 11 percent, which is where it peaked uh, last year. And then core PPI. So wholesale prices, excluding uh, food and energy, you had you know, a five and a half number, which is down 0.7 percent uh, month over month and, uh, you know, down about four and a half points from last year's peak. So, you know, that was good news, certainly. You know, we care more about consumer prices than producer prices, but that's moving in the right direction. So then the question, this last bullet from last week, right, um, the question of whether soft landing is more likely. Uh, what do you think, Lawrence, based on this this latest news, um, you know, maybe the odds are still low, but are they higher? Yeah, we we, we think so. I mean, it certainly de depends on how you define soft landing. I think we've talked about soft landing maybe equaling a, a short and shallow type recession or just maybe skirting by with uh, you know low economic growth. Uh, we do think that that still is a, a reasonable expectation. Again, given the the strength of the consumer, given the the fact that the the labor market still remains pretty healthy, and the fact that inflation is moving in the right direction. So it's not. Out of the out of the uh, probabilities just yet, we do think you know a soft landing uh, soft landing can occur. Yeah, I've been calling it muddle through. So maybe it's a short lived mild recession. Uh, maybe maybe it's just sort of stall and flat. But um, that is a possibility. Maybe it's a 
you know, three to one shot, but it's still a possibility. So um, turning to the um, global equity market performance from last week, um, I think you're seeing some interesting trends this year. I mean, maybe we haven't had enough of the year go by uh, to call them trends, but you know, of course, we've we moved higher. We gave a little bit back uh, on um, uh, you know the early part of trading on Tuesday, but we so but still you know markets are up year to date. Um, and what you've seen is the losers from last year are the winners from this year in general, and vice versa. So you know one example of that is the communication services sector with Alphabet, um, you know slash Google, and uh, Meta slash Facebook. Uh, that's um, you know top performing sector this year after being one of the worst last year, and then on the other side, you know the defensive sectors did really well last year. You know your utilities, consumer staples, and those are the laggards uh, this year. Um, we've also seen international continue to perform better. Certainly, the weaker dollar is is part of that, uh, but uh, certainly you've seen in the flows that investors are moving more into non U.S. Uh, you know, that's not a new story. That's really been happening for the last several months, but certainly a, you know, a trend that has um, continued this year. Um, anything here, Lawrence, jump out of you. I know you're the bond guy, but, um, you know, are you seeing anything else, any other themes to pull out of what we've seen last week or over the last month? No, no themes per se, but I, I mean, I think it's still pretty remarkable that, you know, communication services up 12 and a half percent over the past month. We don't typically see that those types of returns out of the bond market. So a little envious of, of, of those returns, uh, you know, over the, over the past month. Yeah. And we've also seen a lot of excitement around the China reopening because you've got, you know, 15% gains in the Hang Seng over the last month. You've got, you know, the, um, the China index up over nine. So uh, that is certainly something to watch. We, we like emerging markets maybe as a short-term trade, big exposure to China, but our sort of medium to longer term uh, outlook in LPA research is still cautious. So um, let's now turn to the uh, fixed income commodity markets. This is your bailiwick, Lawrence. Um, got some positive uh, returns for, for bonds after just a horrific year last year. Yep, for sure. Last year was the worst year ever for core bonds, down about 13%. So the uh, returns that we're seeing uh, this year, not offsetting those those negative returns for sure just yet. But if you look, look at returns coming out of the high yield bond market, the municipal market, these are the uh, the best returns that we've seen to start the year since 2019 for the high yield bond index and 2009 for the municipal market index. So we are starting to claw back some of those returns that we saw last year. Slow and steady uh, is, is kind of the, the name of the game within the fixed income markets. Uh, but we do think that this year, after that tumultuous year last year, we do think bonds are going to be boring and, and get back to their traditional role. And it's good to see that uh, we're seeing some positive returns out of those, those fixed income markets this year. Yeah, and it, it, it seems like as yields have moved higher, you know, maybe not in the last you know month or two, but as yields have moved higher off of zero, um, you know, you've got more competition for stocks. And certainly that affects valuations, right? When interest rates are higher, you typically have lower stock valuations. Um, you know, and and stocks have rallied as we've as we've noted here recently. You you put all that together, and actually, you know, bonds. I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm an equity strategist, but bonds don't look horrible relative to stocks. How about that for for a compliment? That no, gap, I, I I love to hear it. it, it and and that's what we think too. I mean these. Yields that we're seeing in, in a lot of these markets are the highest they've been in over a decade. So we think for investors that want to take on, you know, maybe less equity risk, maybe more need for income, the bond market is an attractive alternative. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, thanks for that, Lawrence. I guess the, you know, really quickly on commodities, uh, we think gold looks pretty good here. Uh, so um, certainly our our chief technical strategist, Adam Turnquist, has been talking a lot about gold. We upgraded gold in November of last year. And, and that's, you know, turned out to be a good move. We still see more upside uh, for gold going forward, helped by lower interest rates and certainly uh, geopolitical tensions around the world. You know, the other metal, just quickly, copper, uh, actually, you know, copper is a big China metal. Uh, more than half of the global uh, demand for copper comes from China. And with the reopening and stim obviously some, some stimulus on top of that, uh, with some of the programs that they've enacted to support the real estate sector. 
Popper might actually be a good place to be uh, this year. Um, it's it's somewhat in in short supply, you know, inventories relative to long term uh, averages. So um, you know, keep an eye on copper. Could see again. This is inflationary, but could certainly. Uh, see um, the metals is a good place to be uh, in general in 2023. So turning, um, you know, to an S&P 500 chart from, again, from Adam Turquist, the, um, you know, the good news here with this recent bounce, uh, I think is not just that the chart pattern is getting better. You know, you're you're making some higher lows and you're at least about to make maybe a higher high and and this this looks like a somewhat of a supportive uh chart pattern but if you look at the bottom half of this of this chart you actually see breadth right it's percentage of s&p 500 stocks that are above the 200 day moving average and and that's that's really strong so that tells you that there's a lot of participation in this market uh which um which we think is is bullish and maybe increases the odds that we can make a run at some of these technical resistance levels you know, we've talked at our investment committee meeting yesterday about 4,100, and then after that, maybe 4,300. So those are those are kind of the lines in the sand, and um, you know, hopefully, that's breadth along with some better fundamentals. You know, over the next quarter or two, can can get us over those those hurdles. So um, let let's get to the you know the main portion of of the podcast today, which is a bull bear debate. So you know, Lawrence, you'll have to take maybe the other side. Of these, once we uh, once we get into them, although I'll, I'll I'll take your word for it on the Fed because you're one of our big Fed watchers. But the four um, bull bear debates that we we covered in this week's in market commentary are uh, number one, the economy, right, recession, soft landing, model through, all of that. Uh, bull bear debate number two, Fed, you know, when are they going to stop and what does it mean? Uh, debate number three is on earnings. There are a lot of bears and a lot of bulls. Um, we're probably closer to the bulls than the bears, uh, which we'll explain. But, you know, certainly a lot of disagreement about the earnings outlook for 2023. And then lastly um, is um, is China. And, you know, is the reopening bullish or bearish? You know, certainly there are two sides to that. So, so let's get into this, Lawrence. We're going to start with the economy. So, Kind of this is the view of the team. Uh, you know, several of us, including yourself, worked on this. Um, so I'll just read it. You know, you're seeing it on the slide. The US economy either narrowly avoids recession or enters a mild and short-lived recession in the early to middle part of 2023, easing inflation pressures in a stable job market with only modest additional tightening from the Fed are keys to limiting the severity of an economic downturn. So you know, I'll take the, um, you know, the bull side of this, Lawrence, and say, you know, we've never had a recession with anywhere close to the amount of employment that we have today. And consumers' balance sheets are very strong. They can get jobs, even if they get laid off from a tech company, right? Employees that want to land quickly, uh, by all accounts, are landing quickly. With consumer being 70% of the economy, uh, that's... Um, you know, suggest that maybe, maybe we can muddle through. So I, I think that's the bull case. Uh, what would you say, uh, you know, well, you can either agree or disagree with that, but I want to hear the bear case from you. Yeah, for sure. No, do agree with that. I guess the 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 bear side of that equation is we're, we've seen easing inflationary pressures, but we haven't gotten back to those 2% levels that the Fed wants to see. And this is related, I think, to the next uh, uh, next topic as well. But if inflationary pressures stay stubbornly high, that would mean more work for the Fed to do, which would likely mean higher interest rates and potentially a deeper recession to get those inflationary pressures back down to that 2% target. You know, we've seen, like I said, some, some positive uh, direction in terms of inflationary pressures, but we're not there yet. Uh, so it, as long as those inflationary pressures continue to come down, we think this, uh, you know, the, the soft landing probability is, is still likely. Uh, but you know it's not a done deal for sure. Yeah, no doubt. I, I think the the best case for the bears, um, you know, in addition to the Fed, because you know we know from history most recessions are caused by Fed over tightening. Uh, the best case for the bears, I think, is these really effective 
uh, leading indicators of recession, right? Mainly the yield curve and the uh, the LEI index, the leading economic uh, indicators index that really have good batting average and, and are certainly telling us we'll have recession. We hate to say it's different this time, but you know it could be. Uh, the It's different this time could just be that we get a recession like these you know, forward-looking indicators are telling us, but it's just not quite as bad as maybe uh, people think or maybe history would would see. Yeah, and, so. and just one caveat on that too, Jeff, is that we, that we know these these recessionary indicators, they they talk about the probability of recep, uh, a recession, not necessarily the depth and the length of recession. So even these you know yield curve signals that are flashing warning signs, uh, that only indicates that. Treasury markets are are signaling a, a high probability of recession, but doesn't really say anything about the depth and length of the recession. So um, just a, a, a quick caveat on those uh, signals that we're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Not, not our base case, but there's even a possibility that we already had a short, mild recession, right? And there's also a possibility that we can stave off recession until 2024. You know, that those are possibilities, um, certainly... You know, not a forecast, but but a possibility. So those are just our forecasts for economic growth for this year. I'll move past that and we'll get to our next debate, Lawrence, in, in the interest of time. So next debate is the, the Fed, and this is certainly uh, something you you watch as closely as anybody on the LPA research team. Um, you know, you see here the sort of house view, right? The, um, well, actually, I would argue the house view is kind of in between the Fed and the market, right? The Fed is basically saying no cuts this year, market saying two cuts, maybe the right answer is in the middle at one. Um, but you know, I'll read this. How how the diverging policy expectations between the market and the Fed get resolved boils down to the rhetorical glass half full, glass half empty uh question. Our expectation is the Fed will stop hiking in March after two more 25 basis point hikes, uh 25 basis points, which will be a positive catalyst, we think, for stock market performance in the coming year. So how does that sound to you, Lawrence? Yeah, that's certainly our our base case. The the Fed is meeting next week where we'll likely get a, another 25 basis point rate hike at the conclusion of that meeting. They meet again in March, uh, and maybe we get another 25 basis point hike at that meeting as well. That would take the Fed funds rate to 5% on the, on the upper bound uh, level there. And we think that's it. I mean, the, the Fed has done a lot of work. The Fed, as we know, uh, raised rates aggressively last year. Uh, and we know that there's a, a long and variable lag associated with those rate hikes. So we do think that the Fed is going to maybe take a step back and see how those rate hikes flow into the real economy. So um, we do think that two more hikes to, uh, and then uh, and then they may be done. As it relates to cuts, yeah, I mean, the markets are pricing in a pretty aggressive rate cutting campaign towards the end of uh, this year and into next year. That may be a bit overdone. Uh, we think maybe there's a cut to bring, uh, you know, rates still at restrictive levels, but maybe not as restrictive as they will be at 5%. Uh, so maybe that's a, a, a bit of a mispricing by the markets, but certainly uh, we, we do tend to agree that, you know, 5% at the upper bound for for the uh, the Fed funds rate is probably it. Yeah, you, you're seeing the, um, the chart from our weekly market commentary about expectations priced into the bond market versus the Fed forecast. And, and, and there's, there's quite a difference there. Um, the difference being those couple of cuts uh, potentially that the market sees at the end of the year. I mean, if we get a recession and it looks like a typical recession, uh, the Fed's gonna be under a lot of pressure to cut. And by the end of the year, uh, the you know recent hikes uh, that we've seen, or even the hikes that we're about to see, will have more time to flow through the economy They've hit housing, certainly, but they're going to hit the rest of the economy. And uh, we'll see more slowdown. We'll see more uh, layoffs, unfortunately, but that's kind of the price you pay in a cycle like this. And, uh, you know, the, the world's going to look a little different uh, at the end of the year, certainly. So, uh, you know, a cut wouldn't surprise us, I think, is probably uh, the best way to put it. Yep, so um, sure. and I guess the, the bare argument for this is that inflation, again, would just stays more elevated than what markets expect. And the, the Fed has to keep continue to raising rates maybe up to 6%. And in that case, we would see, you know, lower stock prices probably and, lo and lower bond prices for sure. Uh, but that's not our base case. That's really the, the bare case uh, to this debate. Right. And if you focus exclusively on the labor market, and, and certainly 
you know, that's that's worrisome that the Fed will focus exclusively on the labor market and continue to, um, you know, hammer these hikes until they see that that job market start to crack. Those job openings start to come down. You know, we've got still about 1.7 job openings for every unemployed person down from two to one. So um, they got more work to do. Uh, hopefully the next 50 basis points in total is enough. Uh, but there's certainly a, a realistic uh, possibility that it's not. So turning to the next uh, bull bear debate, this is one that I, I enjoy because it's the, um, you know, I'm kind of the earnings guy in the in the department here. So, um, you know, here's the house view. You see, you know, markets may be pleasantly surprised by modest rather than significant cuts uh, to earnings in 2023, supported by strong revenue, cost controls, and a healthy U.S. consumer. Uh, as I just mentioned, LPA Research expects earnings resilience to be supportive of stocks later this year. So, you know, we'll probably see an earnings decline. We're going to see further cuts to estimates, which is not great. You know, earnings season, I got a few charts on earnings in here. Earnings season has not been very good so far. It's early, but there really has not been uh, any good news, although markets didn't really expect good news. But you know, our view is that towards the second half of the year, as inflation comes down further, maybe we get past the Fed rate hikes, uh, the environment will improve, and uh, perhaps earnings can beat some of these pessimistic expectations uh, on Wall Street. So, you know, we're tracking about 4% decline year over year. That's where we thought we would be when earnings season started based on consensus. I mean, we'll probably add a point or two of upside like we did last quarter, but it's very unlikely to be better than that. Uh, revenue has been a little bit disappointing too. Estimates have come down about 1% already and we're barely 10% done with S&P 500 companies. So, um, you know, the bottom line from just these early reporters is, you know, our forecast for a slight decline in 2023 earnings for the S&P might be a little too optimistic. So there's certainly downside risk there. Um, you know, but estimates have come down a little bit more slowly in, you know, recent weeks than they did last fall. You know, we basically got, you know, $10 haircuts in a hurry uh, in Q3 and Q4. And now into Q1, we're seeing the same thing, but it's just a little bit more modest. So, you know, again, it's early, uh, but look for this pace of estimate declines to slow. And, uh, you know, we still think we can be close to that 220 number. Uh, it's just going to be really tough to hit that unless the economy, you know, recovers in the second half of the year. The, um, you know, a lot of people might ask, well, how can you guys be positive on stocks if earnings are falling? So I just want to highlight this chart from a blog we did recently, and then I'll uh, I'll let you weigh in, Lawrence. This chart shows plots basically the last, you know, seventy years earnings versus stock price performance annually. And so, um, you know, higher stock prices for a year, you get a dot in the upper half, lower stock prices in a year, you get a dot in the lower half. And then the, the earnings growth to the left is earnings declines and to the right uh, earnings growth. So of course you see a lot of dots in the upper right where stocks and earnings move higher. That's, you know, the most likely scenario because stocks and earnings go up 70 to 80 percent of the time. But what's really interesting here is if you look on the left hand side, you know you would think when earnings decline that stocks would decline, but it's actually mostly the opposite. right? On the left hand side of this chart, more dots are above the line than below the line. And, and essentially what that means is stocks are almost three times as likely to rise when earnings fall as they are to fall when earnings fall. So hopefully folks follow that. It's, you know, it's not an easy concept. So we get the question, um, you know, why is that, right? And I think the answer is, is pretty simple. It's that stocks lead earnings, right? The market anticipates earnings growth or changes in earnings trajectories uh, before they happen. So last fall, when, you know, the stock market was down 25% at its trough, the market was pricing in, we think, an earnings recession right? Maybe a five to 10% decline in earnings. Right now, earnings are kind of tracking flattish or a little bit positive. 
uh, market was saying it's, it was going to be quite a bit worse than that. Market might be right, but that's how this happens because markets price in uh, the earnings decline before it happens. And then as you come out of that earnings recession or come out of that regular recession, uh, stocks respond uh, positively, start rallying before the actual earnings growth uh, resumes. So I think that's a really interesting chart. Uh, and it, frankly, the result may may surprise people. So, you know, our bullish case, I'll let you handle the bear case, Lawrence, but the bullish case here is expectations are so low the you know, an earnings recession is already priced in based on what we've seen the market do here. And therefore, stocks may respond positively when the bad news isn't quite as bad as feared. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the key takeaway. It's markets are forward looking mechanisms. So a lot of the the negative earnings growth has been discounted, and you know probably uh, you know the the bear case in that situation would be earnings are worse than what's already priced in. You know again not our base case, but if if earnings come in uh, lower, if earnings growth declines more than what we've what's already priced in, you could see you know uh, you know stock prices fall more. Uh, but because the the market is a forward looking mechanism, a lot of the negativity or a lot of negative sentiment in terms of of earnings growth is is probably frankly already priced in. Yeah, all about expectations for sure. So let's do our last uh, bull bear debate, Lawrence, and then we'll move on to just a quick look at the the data this week. So China, uh, China's reopening is more bullish than bearish. That's the house view uh, at LPL Research, uh, but global. Of course, geopolitical tensions remain a risk. They pretty much always are. Uh, China-heavy emerging market equity is more of a trade than a long-term investment at this point. So I think the bull case is it's a trade on the China reopening and on a weaker dollar and certainly on the valuations, right? Because, uh, you know, international stocks got really cheap last year. So, um, you know, that's the bull case. What would you say is the bear case here, Lawrence? Yeah, I, I mean, just the, the bear case would be that the reopening causes inflation uh, to to increase, particularly in the commodity complex. You've had a, a, a vast number of people locked up for for uh, many years, and now they're going to reopen. And and as we saw here in the U.S., that reopening does maybe add to inflationary pressures. So uh, that may you know force the Fed and other central banks globally to do more. Um, but you know, as as kind of as messy as it's been so far, maybe that's not as a big a concern. We do think there's going to be more of a, a growth story than than an inflationary story. But you know that that is always back of mind when you're when you think about reopenings. Is that uh, that the pressure on inflation? Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe you know we still like the energy sector. So maybe that's a play on China that's a little more comfortable than actually buying Chinese stocks, which certainly makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Uh, if you do uh, want to trade uh, EM in China, then we would we would just be uh, careful and watch them closely. Maybe keep it on a short leash. Um, so thanks for that, Lawrence. Let's let's just wrap up the call by looking at a quick um, you know list of of the key events this week. So for me, I think the most important data point is the PCE deflator, right? The the Fed's favorite inflation measure, and uh, you know just like we talked about with the producer price index. Uh, you know, PCE numbers are getting are getting better and better. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we think that uh, the, the the inflationary pressures are going to continue to show up in these these PCE uh, releases. What's interesting is if consensus is right and four point four percent on the core PCE deflator is the actual number, that would mean that the Fed funds rate is above the uh, the the inflationary number uh, for the first time this year. So that. You know, is is generally speaking, when that happens, that means rates are sufficiently restrictive to to impact inflation. So uh, again, we we do think inflationary pressures are are trending in the right way, and and that should give uh, the the Fed some ammunition to 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 pause over the next couple of months. Yeah, so I, I certainly don't have an edge on calling PCE data, but if we do get a better than expected number, I mean, we're getting close to a core PCE year over year with a three handle on it. And after you've seen nine, three sure feels good. <laughs> so I'll say it like that. Uh, of course, we also get GDP, the first read on Q4 GDP. I think people might be surprised, you know, even though consensus is 2% plus, people might be surprised by that number. And we'll end up with a really strong finish to 2022 in terms of Q3, Q4 
GDP. Now that could be setting us up for an eventual official recession because you could pull back, the economy could pull back off of those, you know, higher, high watermarks in, in GDP. But nonetheless, economy held up pretty well uh, late last year. And we don't see any reason why we can't actually hit this number, you know, in the mid, let's call it mid to high twos. Don't pay attention to the Atlanta Fed GDP now forecast, though. That's that really runs hot <laughs> saying four. Well, we certainly wouldn't expect that. Um, and then beyond those data points, we've just got um, we've just got a bunch of earnings. So, um, you know, the 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 results Monday and Tuesday were not very good, frankly. I'll call it more of the same. And so, um, you know, again, it's going to be tough to generate much upside to consensus earnings forecasts when we continue to get you know, let's call it mixed, mixed results. So um, here's some of the big names you're seeing. Microsoft's probably going to get more attention than any. Uh, everybody's focused certainly on the layoffs and on technology's need to, you know, sort of digest uh, some of the excess hiring during the pandemic. They're still not quite done with that. So we're cautious on tech and LPL research on our um, tactical glass allocation committee, uh, but certainly uh, watching that sector very closely, uh, that, that they could be in for a second, good second half uh, after they get kind of through, let's call it right sizing for the um, for the for the new environment. So, anything else uh, here, Lawrence? You want to weigh in on, or should we wrap? Just real quick, there's no central bank uh, activity out of the U.S. this week. Fed, there's no Fed speak. The Fed is in their self-imposed blackout period. Bank of Canada meets tomorrow where they're expected to raise rates by 25 basis points and then pause. And if that is truly the case, then that would, again, provide you know additional ammunition or or reason to believe that the Fed is, is going to be close to their or close to be, being done with their rate hiking campaign as well. So something to watch for out of, out of Canada tomorrow. Yeah, we don't pay a lot of attention to Canada, but certainly, um, you know, we've become global central bank watchers for the last couple of years. And, um, you know, Canada's economy, even though we don't talk about it a lot, it it, it does matter. So, uh, yeah, thanks for that. We're watching Europe more closely. They've really surprised, I think, uh, with the European economy hanging in there uh, better than expected. But, uh, yeah, don't, don't forget about Canada. So, um, I think those are the key data points to watch for this week, but here's a full list. I'll just run through this really quickly. So um, we do get these uh, S&P manufacturing surveys, which, you know, probably going to be a little bit soft. They've actually been better in Europe. Uh, and then we get some housing data as well. So we'll, and consumer sentiment. So certainly report back to you on what's interesting for next week. And then international, it's all about confidence. And, um, you know, the fact that, you know, the war in Ukraine is is still going and doesn't have a clear um, exit, I think. Yet, we're seeing really nice sentiment, economic sentiment uh, in, in Europe is, is frankly amazing. So um, you've seen that in better performance for European stocks. Uh, we'll certainly continue to watch uh, the data, in particular out of, out of Germany this week, uh, to see if that that recent trend of better than expected economic performance out of Europe can, can continue. So um, with that, um, we'll we'll go ahead and wrap. So thanks, Lawrence, for, for joining. Thanks to all of you uh, for listening to another edition of LPL Market Signals. Uh, it's good to be actually back in the office to record Market Signals. I've typically been doing that in my home office. So it's nice to, to be sort of uh, distraction-free. Nothing against my kids or my wife, but nice to be distraction free. <laughs> so with that, uh, everybody have a, have a great week. Uh, thanks for listening as always. And uh, we'll see you next time.